All right. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, so um, I think we're ready to start. Um, let me make a short introduction into today's colloquium. Um, so until now, uh, we've been discussing very different topics that are connected with electrochemistry, um, especially those including the surface signs, um, like catalysis, um, electrolytes, characterization techniques, of course, and most importantly, the solid electrolyte interfaces, which are central to the scope of electrochemistry in principle. So the, the properties and, and behavior of such interfaces um, depend on the type of the solid and liquid, which are make the contact, obviously. However, this means that, for example, the metal electrolyte interface is rather different from the semiconductor electrolyte interface. And um, that is because of the difference in charge densities of the thermal level and bend alignment and so on. Now, with regard to this, I think it's important to note um, that uh, I personally, I find it um, quite important that the traditional courses in electrochemistry today, they discuss still mostly metal electrolyte interfaces. They just provide them as examples of what electrochemical processes are and what kind of phenomena you can expect. However, in the labs, we often work, we often do research on much more complicated materials, which are often closer to semiconductors rather than pure metals. And um, maybe I can give you a few examples. Um, for example, many battery materials upon intercalation or deintercalation, depending if it's a cathode or anode, are in fact doped semiconductors. Many electrocatalysts are also to some extent semiconductors, especially when you go to uh, the nanoscale phenomenon. Um, the photoelectrochemistry is completely based on semiconductors. Electrochemical transistors, um, the sensors and biosensors are also often um, based on semiconductors. So as you see, these semiconductors are somewhat ubiquitous in, in the electrochemical experiments. And this is why in this colloquium, we're going to discuss semiconductor electrolyte interfaces as a separate topic. So today we're hosting Professor Jung Cheng from Samming University, who is a well-known theoretician and expert in semiconductor electrolyte interfaces. So Jun received his PhD at uh, the Queen's University Belfast in 2008, and then he was a postdoc at the University of Cambridge. And from about 2013, um, he's a professor at the, the College of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at Samming. So Jun, thank you so much for joining us. Um, now the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, should I start to share? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, all right, you got my screen now? Yes, um, it all works. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Andre, for the uh, kind of uh, invitation and the introduction, really. Um, it's, uh, it's really a good, it's a pleasure to uh, share some of our thoughts on the um, uh, interface in this case semiconducting oxide water interface uh, uh, at the beginning i would like to point out that this logo i show on the right uh, left corner here is the um, um, this year is the 100 years anniversary of xiamen university so we really sh uh, want to show this logo everywhere so anyway um, um and you just mentioned that um uh, semiconducting oxide water interface is really important uh, and uh, uh, we can find lots of applications. Um, although a traditional um, electrochemistry, usually in the textbook, you start with a uh, metal, uh, metal uh, water interface. So um, uh, uh, actually, interestingly, when we start to look at the interface, we start oxide water interface. Just recently, we moved to metal oxides, a sort of opposite. The reason is mainly tech, really technical, because uh, at that time, metal is too expensive to calculate, really. But anyway, uh, uh, semiconducting oxide water interface is always a fascinating topic to me. Uh, it's very uh, difficult, and also the uh, really, the uh, it's just uh, it's highly interdisciplinary, as I will um, mentioning the following that the um, 
they actually really many diff people from different fields uh, very often see the interface from a very different angle and uh, come out with uh, 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 sometimes very even very different terms uh, make it very difficult to communicate um, anyway um, hopefully in the following I will show you some of our thought uh, and uh, uh, and also uh, in between and after I'm uh, happy to uh, to discuss. Okay, here's the outline of my talk. I will first give some background uh, and then I will uh, present our method uh, mainly based on initial molecular dynamics for computing redox potential and PKAs uh, in solution. And then I'll move to band alignment across the interface. Um, not only in the band alignment, also the electronic levels are the interface. Okay, that uh, surely will be uh, important for many catalytic reactions. For instance, proton coupled electron transfer uh, happened on lots of uh, oxide catalysts. And in the end, I will touch, touch on the uh, electrified interface. So um, where um, the proton and electron really uh, interact. Um, so I will stop somewhere here in between uh, so that we can have a first discussion. Okay, uh, as Andrew already mentioned that really the energy is the, uh, um, uh, is the key driver for lots of uh, up, um, study these days in at the interface. So we know um, where the world is facing the energy issue, we try to push in uh, lots of application, uh, for example, the energy uh, optimization of energy efficiency for uh, carbon-based fuels. That's many topic of surface catalysis. We also want to utilize in solar energy and based on lots of semiconductor photo or electro uh, chemistry. And also, of course, we want to uh, the energy need get stored and transferred and also the energy conversion. In, uh, uh, problem. So that's, um, I would say that's a lot of uh, electrochemistry, many interfacial electrochemistry. So that's lots of fundamental issue need to be addressed before um, the, the uh, real world technology. Uh, for, in for instance, uh, the fuel cells, uh, of course, we already have lots of uh, uh, batteries, the uh, electric cars and so on. But the fuel cell, uh, I guess we are not ready yet. And also the solar cells, uh, that's something I guess also for the future. Um, that's lots of uh, applica energy applications of those uh, electric cells. Just to point out that uh, I, I will use the photoelectrochemical cell as an example. That's really the pioneer already in the, in the field um, a long time ago. That's, uh, uh, for instance, that's a, a, a figure I, I like very much. Uh, from Professor Nozick. So across the uh, photoelectrochemical cell, you, uh, very often we can see this type of level diagrams. As you can see here, uh, that's the, our interface. Here, the semiconductor anode. Um, we already can see the, there's a, a valence band, a conduction band. Under photo excitation, we know that an electron is actually excited from the valence band to the conduction band and leaving a hole behind and the electron will transfer very often to a metal cathode uh, uh, here to reduce water, for instance, in this case, and the holes um, um, actually uh, on the cathode to oxidize water. So in order for the electron to transfer across the, uh, the cell, um, we really need to have the right alignment. Uh, in this case, for the hole to be active enough to oxidize the water, then this, this valence band edge need to lie below in this, in this uh, scale that's basically more positive or more oxidizing than the, than the um, oxygen evolution level. And on the other hand, the conduction band need to lie above the hydrogen uh, evolution level. So that's basically uh, more reductive than the uh, than the um, than this level, so um, that's already this type of level alignment already determines the thermodynamics really of the electron uh, across the uh, interface. So the theoretician that's really the 
first task for us to really calculate those levels. When I um, talking about, I will talk about lots of energy levels in this talk, um, but really what the electronic levels we uh, very often talk about. Um, first of all, think of uh, redox chemistry in aqueous solution. Um, very often, we, for instance, I, I want to show this, um, this diagram here. Uh, for an ally, um, when we have a um, equilibrium structure, okay, suppose in a polar solution, okay, uh, like in water, um, we could do we we could oxidize the, the this ally by first by two steps actually. The first, firstly, vertical vertically analyzing this ally, basically removing this electron from the ally. Um, with all the solvent molecule uh, fixed. So that's very, very, uh, very often happened in photo emission uh, progress because it ha happens so fast, then the solvent don't have really the time to, to reorganize, uh, reorganize, okay? In this case, that's corresponding to a non-equilibrium structure. Okay, for for this uh, uh, in this case a neutral molecule or a radical. Given time, um, okay, normally uh, maybe after and the solvent structure will react to a equilibrium structure uh, associated with the oxidized uh, for this oxidized state. Okay, so associated with this. This, we, this process, we will have a reorganization energy um, due, uh, due to the solvent reorganization. So then the energy difference between the equilibrate reduced state and the equilibrate oxidized state, then we have this free energy. Um, in el electrochemistry, we call the redox potential, right? That's a free energy. Um, similarly, we can use in this uh, Marcus type of diagram, okay? Uh, we have a, a energy surface uh, so, uh, corresponding to the reduced state and also a free energy surface uh, or uh, energy surface uh, 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 um, corresponding to the oxide state, okay? Uh, so we have a uh, arbitrary uh, reaction coordinate, okay? So that's really the same. Uh, we can vertically analyze in this anion. Okay, that's where corresponding to this IP, vertical ionization potential. Then we reach to a, a higher energy uh, point. After some time, it will reorganize, okay, to reach this minimum associated with the, uh, the minimum of this potential energy surface of oxidized state. Okay, then that's a way of the difference of the uh, free energy. And uh, um, an opposite process can also happen. We can vertically attach an electron to the oxide state. Um, okay, that will be, then this structure, uh, the solvent structure remain uh, like this. After a while, the solvent structure, okay, will reorganize or relax to the reduced state, okay? That will give another reorganization energy. So that's a vertical electron attachment, ver uh, electron affinity. Anyway, so if we put all this energy in a level diagram, we will have a vertical ionization potential correspond to that energy difference. We reference to the vacuum, okay? That will be this level, so, but, um, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as we already see from the sign, right? The vertical ionization potential is a, um, normally a very large positive value. If we take the vacuum as a reference, so the level will below the vacuum, um, here is a minus sign. Um, then the electron affinity, the vertical electron affinity of the oxidized state, um, just to point out the subscript really, that's that's uh, R correspond to the reduced state O correspond to the oxide state. Um, so this energy difference will correspond basically this size uh, we have here. Um, and for the 
this delta A, that will be the free energy difference of these two states. Um, as I mentioned, that corresponding to the redox energy uh, of this process. That's a free energy difference. So it will lie somewhere in between these two in a linear response region, like uh, assumed in Marcus theory, then this level lies right in the middle of the two levels. That's basically say the reorganization energy um, on this, on the reduced potential energy surface and the, on the oxidized potential energy surface will be the same, okay? Um, that's a linear response region. But the, to really just quick uh, summarize, so for any uh, one electron, in this case, oxidation, oxidation or reduction process, we actually have three levels associated with this process. We have two vertical levels uh, corresponding to the vertical electron affinity and the vertical ionization potential. And the one we call it the adiabatic level, that's a really a free energy level that's uh, corresponding to the redox potential, um, uh, what we very often say in electrochemistry. Um, okay, um, so of course the redox potential determining the thermodynamics for the electron transfer process. And the, uh, we, 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 we already know from the Marcus theory, uh, this formula, you can see the reorganization energy also kicks in in the uh, electron transfer kinetics. So uh, that's will can be transferred to the vertical energies. Um, anyway, so the thermodynamics of the electron transfer is determined by the free energy difference, which is uh, associated here with those potential about the vertical energy, vertical energy levels determine or uh, also determine the kinetics. Uh, for the electron transfer. Okay, so that, that's just to show uh, why it's important to, do, to, to know all these levels and not, not just the adiabatic level, the redox level, but also the, the vertical levels. Um, similarly, in solid, um, especially in semi, uh, semiconductor physics, uh, there's a really a big field. People try to determine the defect levels in the in the in the uh, for, uh, in the in the band gap of semiconductors, you can see in uh, in this type of uh, energy diagram. Okay, um, you see similar potential energy surface that's really corresponding to any defect associating with different charging states. Uh, you can the defect can charge with uh, can have zero charge, one positive charge, or two positive charge uh, for each. Ox uh, oxidation state, um, you will have a potential energy surface uh, along some configuration coordinate. Okay, you can also have similar uh, 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 really argument that I just show in the last slides. And in the field, people also do lots of calculations, try to put the adiabatic level, so those defect levels and the uh, um, so that will be vertical and adiabatic levels in uh, in along with the uh, with the uh, the band, the valence and the conduction band. So that's uh, that's really similar. Um, um, I, I will talk a bit later uh, in the computational um, uh, computing those energy levels. That's actually uh, many technical issues are really the, uh, also the same. So just say for for water and the semiconductor, just look at the bulk property. Very often we, we do the uh, redox level calculation or alignment and also the defect level. So that's a, a two separate field, field. But just to um, really put them into the same context, I just want to point out that that's in electrochemistry, probably uh, for chemistry students already in year one, we we uh, we do this frost diagram, um, so that's basically uh, uh, tell the uh, the free energy for different uh, oxidation state in this in this case manganese, and just to point out that that's the hydrogen impurity in gallium nitride. Okay, the hydrogen impurity can have different oxidation state. Also, you can have 
uh, hydrogen zero, proton that's uh, plus and hydride minus, okay? Depends on the Fermi energy of the system, you can actually have different oxidation state for this hydrogen impurity. That's exactly the same um, as what we, uh, we do in electrochemistry. If you have different uh, um, uh, oxidation environment, your, the, 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 the manganese can have different oxidation state, right? Just, uh, just to make this uh, slightly more interesting, just to point out that we all know that manganese six plus is not stable because at uh, this point, uh, if it lies above the connecting line between the manganese seven plus and the manganese four plus, that's to say this manganese six plus is unstable. It will, um, it will uh, go undergoes a disproportionate uh, reaction, right? So that's we uh, know already uh, for chemistry students already know that in year one. And uh, very similarly in semiconductor physics, people to calculate, for example, uh, uh, that's a work uh, uh, from Professor uh, Vanuola and Noig Bauer. Um, you can see in here the proton, okay, the, uh, that's plus and H minus uh, hydride, um, like this crossing point lies below uh, this um, neutral hydrogen atom, this line associated with the hydrogen zero. That's basically say, says when we change the Fermi energy of the system, this, the hydrogen impurity can direct transfer, tra transform uh, between the H plus and H minus state, skipping this hydrogen zero. So that's the same as here. Um, anyway, just to point out that's really the same thing, although that's a very different field. And this level in, in uh, semiconductor physics is called the charge transition level. So that's basically also a, a some, some type of uh, redox free energy. Um, transforming hydrogen plus to hydrogen minus uh, in gallium nitride. Um, okay, uh, we can go a bit even more. Uh, think of you, we can even using the, uh, this notation, right? We very often do uh, for defects uh, in semiconductor. Uh, we can say uh, for the redox chemistry in the ions in water, the ions can have different oxidation state like any defect. Uh, point defect in solid, they have different charge state like uh, F centers and so on in manganese oxide, right? And also uh, we can write the proton, think of as a proton interstitial, okay? That's a really a, 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 a defect physics term. And OH minus, you could even think of that as a proton vacancy and the uh, hydroxyl radical can be considered as a hydrogen vacancy. Of course, in the notation, we we using the uh, this superscript to uh, distinguish the the charge of those point defect. So, just um, when we look at the uh, starting the interface, uh, like uh, the, uh, in electrochemistry, really we could using that as a conceptual link between the aqueous redox chemistry and the solid state. Uh, physics. So that's, uh, that's, although the terminology is sometimes different, but uh, uh, the underlying physics and chemistry are really the same. Uh, um, so just a quick introduction on the um, aqueous, the energy levels in aqueous solution and the uh, bulk semiconductors. Uh, goes to the interface. Um, I, I want to say something about the electro potential that's really uh, or the electro potential or electrochemical potential in electrochemistry uh, textbook um, just in electrochemistry uh, very often um, although we in electrochemistry measurement we measure electro potential but very often we don't really know the absolute electro potential um, even the definition of absolute electropotential is not 
that quite clear after the electrochemistry was actually uh, well developed. And that's a really informative uh, uh, text from Professor Trasati in 1986. I, I really recommend you to, to read that. So um, in electrochemistry, uh, very often we, um, to, to define the absolute electro potential is a matter of defining or choosing the potential reference. Um, of course, in physics, we very often choose the vacuum potential as a uh, reference of vacuum reference. But it really in your electrochemical, uh, electrochemistry setup, uh, we can really have at least three types of vacuum. Um, in here, in this plot, we, that's our metal electrode. Suppose that's our solution. We actually can define vacuum just outside the metal surface. Okay, that's one type of vacuum. And also a vacuum just outside the solution. Okay, just outside the solution. Of course, uh, in physics, we always have a vacuum at infinity. So there are three types of vacuum. Um, in many computational work, we very often forget about the differences uh, between these vacuum re references. Um, they actually are very different. In electrochemistry, P Professor Trasati explicitly explained that, uh, and I also compare different potential reference and explicit uh, uh, said that really the, the vacuum just outside the uh, electrolyte solution surface is, is a very, is a suitable and is a very good reference for, for electrochemistry. So that, uh, I guess since then, uh, we agree that we in electrochemistry, we choose the vacuum um, outside the solution as a reference, not the vacuum outside the metal or semiconductor uh, uh, electrode, also not the vacuum at the infinity. So that's really, uh, really key. Um, another, another issue is the uh, definition of electrochemical potential. Um, um, so in electrochemistry, we separate the electrochemical potential into two terms. We have a chemical potential and also a, we call the inner potential or the um, uh, Gavani potential. Okay, so that's more of a relate to like the electrostatic part, okay, of this, uh, the, uh, of, the elect of the electrochemical potential, of course, that you need to um, uh, uh, multiply by the charge of the species. So for neutral species, there's no problem. So that will be zero. Electrochemical potential is the same as chemical potential. Of course, in electrochemistry, very often we are dealing with ions. Then um, there's a complication uh, can comes in, uh, depends on how we define our uh, inner potential. But there's another thing in quantum chemistry calculation, we have uh, heart rate potential. When we uh, do calculations, we have uh, positive nuclei surrounding by elect, elect, electron cloud, right? electron density. So th then uh, in any, for example, DFT calculation, we actually have the, uh, this uh, nuclear electron interaction that's a uh, classical uh, uh, Coulomb attraction. And also this J term, that's the electron-electron repulsion potential. Okay, so that's a sort of electrostatic part of the, the whole um, en energy functional, okay? But that's really a, a complication is this, when we are dealing with the electrochemistry, uh, we only need to know the electrochemical potential or the total energy of the system. We don't have to do this partition, okay? But that's a conceptual advantage in electrochemistry to separate this into two terms. But um, sometimes I guess uh, we just very often get confused uh, um, between the concept of the inner potential and the electrostatic potential. They are really not the same. Um, but the, um, that actually goes to 
the, um, there's a so-called Gibbs Guggenheim principle. Okay, it actually states that the electro, electrical potential difference between two regions of different chemical composition cannot be measured. Okay, the term, the two equations I show you in the last slide, that's really, uh, is the sum of a chemical part, okay, and the electrostatic part, okay? And this separation is, is not really, uh, when, when we talk about the, uh, 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 or understand the thermodynamics, we don't need to do the separation. And uh, the gibbs guggenheim principle really, really said that, we can really measure the electrochemical potential difference between the regions of different chemical composition. But the solution really also already uh, uh, pointed out by Gibbs a long time ago, is really the difference of potential in pieces of metal of the same kind attached to the electrode is exactly one of the things we can and do measure. So, only when the chemical composition are the same, um, I want to, I need to go back to this slide. Only when the chemical composition is the same, then for example, the chemical potential uh, component or in this energy functional, the exchange correlation part and there's also this kinet kinetic energy part can be approximate considered as a constant. Then the electrostatic potential or the inner potential difference would be the same as the difference of the electrochemical potential or the total energy, okay? That's the only, we can only do this subtraction when the chemical composition are the same. So that's really also the solution for, 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 for actually many applications and also in, uh, in computation, uh, particularly when we, for instance, uh, compute the interface potential difference, we, we want to only compare the electrostatic potential in the same region. For instance, that's our uh, electrode, that's the electrolyte solution. We, we can charge up the interface and consider or calculate the energy difference between this uh, electro potential of the same electro, uh, electro materials. We, okay, that's to say that this, this difference, this electro static potential in the electrode and in the electrolyte solution, this difference really doesn't have any physical meaning. Only when we consider the difference between these two, okay, uh, we, we, we can uh, subtract the, uh, we can obtain the, the, uh, the interface potential. Okay, so then the solution really is uh, using the potential reference. Uh, and we know in the electrochemistry, uh, all the measurement is done by measuring the electro potential with respect to some reference electrode. Uh, uh, very often we use in standard hydrogen electrodes. So that's, that's the trick. So, so we always uh, uh, measure the relative potentials in electrochemistry. And also that's all how we uh, do our uh, band alignment across the interface uh, in computation. Uh, just to point out that for this uh, standard hydrogen electrode, it can be decomposed into two steps. That's really a high, uh, an aqueous proton get reduced to form gas phase hydrogen. And uh, it's really to uh, can be de uh, decomposed into two steps. That's a uh, solvation or desolvation process of the proton and a gas phase reduction um, reaction for the proton to uh, die hydrogen. So those energy are very easy to calculate. So we only need to know the solvation free energy of protons. So that's, also serve, uh, serves as a reference uh, for, for all our band alignment. Um, so um, in this, uh, back to this um, uh, level alignment diagram I showed you earlier, uh, is really to do the alignment across this interface, the level to put the, this level in solution and all the band level, our defect level in the semiconductor need to 
really put them in the same scale, we need to have a consistent potential reference across the interface. Um, okay, uh, we know the semiconductor water interface um, uh, will, uh, when we uh, polarize the interface, we actually ha have two double layers. Um, so on the, on the one side, we have the space charge layer. On the uh, electrolyzed solution side, we have this electric double layer. So uh, if the uh, concentration, the ionic strength of the solution is high, then we, uh, the uh, diffuse layer is suppressed. We only have this hem hose double layer. So um, to set in the reference for the, uh, the semiconductor water interface, so uh, there's a condition. Um, uh, first of all, we call the um, flat band potential. That's basically, uh, we don't have this band bending inside the semiconductor then uh, that's basically the charge is homogeneous, uh, um, or the, 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 the majority charge carrier homogeneous distribute um, in the semiconductor um, uh, side. And on the, on the solution side, we know the oxide, okay, can take protons. Um, so uh, by acid base reaction, because there's lots of uh, surface OH group have certain, uh, um, um, surface acidity, then there's a, also a pH condition. Uh, we call the point of zero proton charge when the surface carry no net proton charge. Okay, so that's our uh, uh, setting our reference for the interface, the flat band potential and the point of zero charge condition when we don't have the, uh, the net, net charge um, on the, uh, at the interface, and we don't have the double layer at all. But the double layer will form when deviating from the potential of zero charge, uh, a flat band potential condition, and the point of zero proton charge condition. Just to point out that there's a well known Nernstein relation. The flat band potential can shift in with the pH, right? That's basically because. On the, on the solution side, when we change the pH deviating from the uh, uh, point, point of zero proton charge, so you will have a home host layer that will shift in the potential. Very often it's found that the flat band potential uh, has a linear relationship with the pH and with the slope is really a, a 50 millieV right, per pK unit. So that's a, a so-called Nernstein relation. I will talk, touch on this topic uh, towards the end of my presentation. Okay, so uh, we will start with the neutral surface uh, interface at the begin uh, uh, as a start. And the methodology we use is really based on the initial molecular dynamics. That's a, uh, uh, is a very expensive method that's a take, but it really accounts for those are very important uh, 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 chemistry and physics in the phase. Um, although expensive, it's, uh, it's really a good benchmark for this type of study. Um, so um, we know the electron transfer or the chemical option are very important at the for the electrode. So we really have to take into account the electronic structure of the electrode. And uh, on the other side, the solution, the water is really dynamical. Uh, we, uh, we better use molecular dynamics to do the sampling, um, uh, including the dielectric screening and even the uh, dynamic structure of the surface. So it's a very good tool for modeling um, e interfacial electrochemistry, but uh, I have to really mention it's very expensive. Um, anyway, uh, now I want to talk about the, how we calculate those energy levels first in uh, aqueous solution, but um, I guess it's not a, a re, um, the audience, not necessarily all theoretician. I just really goes a bit faster. If you have any question, we can discuss uh, uh, during the break. So the challenge is in com computing the energy levels, actually, uh, at least I, I, uh, I can think of four uh, very, uh, uh, really, uh, they are really tricky. First of all, it's a uh, free energy calculation method. So as I said, we need to do molecular dynamic sampling. All the configurations uh, we have really go directly calculating the free energy of the whole system. As I also mentioned, the potential reference is always a, an, an issue uh, already in electrochemistry experiment. That's also an issue for 
computation. I will also mention that um, there's another issue associated with the finite size error because when we're simulating um, um, condensed phase uh, like liquid water, we very often using the uh, periodic boundary condition. But if we calculate the charged species, so the the charge will interact with these uh, their images, so that will uh, have uh, certain consequences due to this uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions. Uh, another problem is really uh, 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 our calculation based on density functional uh, approximations. Very often, it's an expensive method that we use in standard GGA functional, and GGA is notoriously uh, 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 bad for calculating energy levels. Um, for in the semiconductor physics, people know that they really GGA underestimates the band gap. Of, of semiconductors, that's really also the same when we calculating the redox potential or determining the band gap for the water, we, we also encounter a very large error. Um, okay, just first, how to calculate the free energy, just quickly give you um, an analogy. Uh, as I mentioned, that I, I show you this, uh, really this level uh, triples uh, um, earlier on. So we have this adiabatic level, that's our free energy, uh, that's our redox potential. And in the Marcus picture, so the, uh, in the linear response region, so this, this free energy lies right in the middle of these two vertical energies. So then the ver adiabatic energy you can think of is uh, really take the average of the vertical ionization potential of the reduced state and vertical electron affinity of the oxidized state, just to show you so that we can calculate in the free energy from, uh, from the vertical energies. So that's for the electron transfer. Uh, similarly, we can generalize this to uh, also take into account uh, like the proton protonation or deprotonation process by removing a, a proton from the system or inserting a proton in the system. Um, um, then we can similarly calculate the free energy of this process by uh, uh, from the uh, from the vertical insertion energy of protons. Okay, the uh, the formal formalism uh, is called um, free energy perturbation theory. Uh, we really just sampling a series of mixing ha uh, Hamiltonian uh, using molecular dynamic. A molecular dynamics, then using the thermodynamic integration to calculate the free energy associated uh, with the uh, proton insertion or electron insertion process. Um, so just re really quickly, uh, in the uh, these methodologies well defined in free energy calculation community. But just point out that when we calculating a free energy, diff um, when we say we calculate free energy, we really calculate the free energy difference. No, um, absolute free energy is very uh, difficult to converge. That's basically say you need to calculate the, uh, the partition function. Uh, uh, very often it's not uh, practical, but the free energy difference can be calculated by really um, so-called uh, uh, thermodynamic immigration. Uh, think of we, we can, um, um, we need to, um basically um construct a a, a thermodynamic path transforming uh, a state um from uh, for uh, from initial state to the final state okay along this thermodynamic path we basically need to calculate the, the force okay um along this free energy curve the force uh from this i i i i i want I won't uh, explain this, but the force is basically associated with the, this vertical energies. That's uh, for a electron insertion process. That's really the vertical uh, energy levels I just pointed out in the last slides. So that's basically this ver this energy vertical energies. We that's uh, uh, basically the force along this thermodynamic path. The free energy difference is basically in integrating of this force along this thermodynamic path. So that's basically uh, uh, the same as a reversible work, okay? Transforming, uh, that's basically the energy you take to trans transforming the state from the uh, beginning to this uh, final state.
Okay, that's uh, so uh, free energy calculation. We always have to construct this thermodynamic path. Um, anyway, um, talk about the um, potential reference, uh, and that's uh, something to do with the electrostatics under the periodic boundary condition. Uh, very often um, uh, in experiments, we always have, have, for example, potential at infinity of uh, uh, as a reference or sort of in this open boundary condition. But in the periodic boundary condition, we don't really have a vacuum uh, infinity to reference to. And then in the standard Everson, there's a mess method to calculate the electrostatic energies on the periodic boundary condition. They take this average electrostatic potential in this cell, in our periodic cell, and take the average of the potential as, a, as zero. So that's the uh, practical uh, uh, solution, let's say, in the uh, error sum. Then the, um, the can just to point out, so that's a very, that's a different reference, okay, between the open boundary condition and the periodic boundary condition. So the potential reference, I just using this, uh, for example, the electrostatic energy of, of any calculating system, you can do a simple sum of the charge multiplied by the potential. The potential is um, uh, somewhat is, is, is not important if the total if the total system is charge neutral. We can see in here we can arbitrarily add a constant, okay? At the arbitrary constant C in here, we separate this contribution, okay? And if the total charge is neutral, okay, is zero, then that term is just gone. It doesn't matter what the potential reference is. But if you have a charged system, then how you choose the potential reference will actually affect the total, total electrostatic energy of the system. So that's the potential reference. Um, so that's basically to show already the difference. We will have actually different potential um, uh, uh, electrostatic energies for open boundary condition and periodic boundary conditions. And that's really an artifact due to this periodic boundary condition we very often use. Um, okay, we, we call this term so-called the Hartree potential shift. Um, that can be uh, our, uh, removed when we um, uh, using the uh, um, our computational standard hatching electrode, I will mention that later on. Um, another issue I already mentioned is this so-called finite size error. If we have a charged species, we, we have the images, and also there's a so-called neutralizing charge background. They will interact with each other. And um, there's um, lots of study already in um, uh, non, um, 1990s, okay. Um, but the good thing, this conclusion was that um, for water, if we have a large dielectric constant, okay, for any uh, bulk, bulk materials have a large dielectric constant, that can screen, effective screen, the, the charge, the electrostatic interaction between the charge and their images and the, the background charge. Yeah, you can, so uh, analytic derivation here, you can see this epsilon, the dielectric constant goes to the leading term. Okay, that's effective screen this term. So that's making it very small. It's the volume term, the, the second term uh, gets dominating. But anyway, uh, people work it out and it's very small for, for water. But the problem of course for, uh, for lots of uh, main group semiconductor like silicon, uh, when you have dielectric constant of uh, around five or ten, the uh, uh, this, this 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 interaction be, uh, this interaction energy between the charge and the images actually can goes up to uh, a few EVs. Then the finite size error is really important and critical, and that's also take a lot uh, a lot of efforts in the uh, computational solid state community to work out an effective uh, correction scheme to take into account this finite size error. But for the solution, in our case, it's actually uh, a water have a dielectric constant of 80. That really effectively screened the, uh, the interaction and the finite size error is, is, is minimal. And for the uh, 
uh, oxide we are dealing with uh, like TiO2, uh, it has a dielectric constant over a hundred. So that's also uh, save uh, us a lot of problem. Okay, then the uh, potential reference I mentioned that we, we um, um, at the periodic boundary condition, we really uh, coupled with uh, this standard hydrogen electrode by also calculating the solvation free energy proton in this bulk solution. Um, then uh, at the same time, we're also uh, inserting an electron. And in this case, there's a both term have a, uh, what I call Hartree potential shift. But when we couple those two terms, then this Hartree potential shift cancel out. Then we can calculate the electro potential or the redox potential with respect to standard hydrogen electro. That's a really a number can be directly compared to, uh, 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 to experiment. So um, that's, that's the, um, that's effectively removing this uncertainty of the potential reference under periodic boundary condition. Just to show you some uh, uh, early calculation of the redox potential of some uh, uh, redox couples in solution and the pKa's of acid in, uh, in solution. So just to, to show for the pKa's, the, um, we use in standard GGA functional we already get a very accurate result. Um, and we also use a hybrid functional to test a few, but it's very expensive. We can't calculate the many uh, at that time, uh, but just to show you the accuracy for PK is really not bad. However, for redox potential, um, as I mentioned that the GGA have a, uh, have really large error for the redox potential. And in this case, on average, half EV. Okay, that's that's not small. Huh? Particularly consider the stability window of water is only 1.2 EV. So the error can, the average error already half EV. Uh, that is not acceptable. Just to point out in the case like for chloride, uh, the error is already on the order of 0.9 volt. That's really way too high. Uh, when we, Using hybrid functional, the error can be halved, just to show you here. Um, the reason we uh, take us a long time to work out, that's really uh, 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 because of the delocalization error in the density functionals. That can go already uh, due to the, uh, the, the band gap problem uh, in, in oxides. And if we consider water also as the oxide, uh, standard GGA functional can significantly underestimate the band gap, okay, uh, of water. So that's the experimental water band gap is around 8.7, but uh, the belief predict band gap around, um, I, uh, I, for the moment, I forget the number, around 5.6 something, uh, that EV. So, and the majority of the error really come from the valence band, okay? The, the error is huge on the order of three EV for the, for the water uh, valence band. Um, interestingly, for the conduction band, the error is only around half, much better, okay? Just to point out the reason we can do this alignment to, 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 to pull those band position is because we use in this com computational hygiene electro I just mentioned, so that we can directly compare this band position with experiment. Okay, uh, um, how that is related to the underestimating uh, 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 the, the error in the, uh, in the redox potential. Just that's we using this so-called Anderson impurity model. If we have any solid level, uh, like atomic level in, in, in for example, chlorine, um, they very often in, interact with the band, can interact with the, uh, 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 think of the solid as the impurity, right? So that will be a, a impurity level um, in, in an oxide. Then if the valence band is too high, okay, placing too high uh, by the uh, error of functional, then also the level also put, will be this will, the band will mix with solid to create an impurity level also lies too high, okay. This level is due to the hybridization between the band and the solid level. That's, we can al already see here, that's the vertical ionization potential. In this case, sorry, that's an OH minus, okay? Not a chlorine. Um, so this level is too high. Uh, we know, uh, we, I already mentioned that the redox potential is calculating by integrating 
the vertical levels that that will re, then that will shift in the potential also to a too high position. Okay, um, and uh, uh, the the vertical electron affinity is actually more or less at the right place because this uh, conduction band is not too bad. Um, if we use a hybrid functional, it will push down the valence band. It will push down the will also. Uh, then the vertical ionization potential also get better. And also uh, 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 at the same time, the redox potential all also lower down, uh, uh, getting closer to the experimental value. So that's the reason why the hybrid functional can uh, alleviate the, the density functionals. So um, just to point out that we can always uh, in uh, using higher level theory to improve the accuracy, of course, the, uh, is a matter of a compromise between the accuracy and the e efficiency, right? Uh, um, we can use in double, double hybrid functional and also the uh, random phase approximation um, that certainly can improve the accuracy, but it's just uh, very expensive. Okay. Um, I'll now move to the um, alignment um, of the TiO2 water interface. So uh, just to show you this structure, um, that's the model very often we, 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 we use for uh, ab initial molecular dynamic simulation. So uh, a, a few hundred atoms that we can afford at that time, we also uh, can run tens of peak second uh, using um, uh, uh, AIMD. Um, just to show, talk about the, um, the root tile TiO2110 surface. So we have these five coordinated titanium sites that can chem uh, water can chemisorb on top. We also have a bridge of oxygen. So these two, um, the water could get a deprotonate. Okay, the water serves as acid. Uh, I will talk about that later. It will can get to protonate to form OH minus, and the bridge side could take up a proton to get a, a positive charge. Um, anyway, so that's just the structure of the interface. Uh, when we're using the computational standard hydrogen electrode, we can align, we can do the band alignment for the uh, TiO2 at the interface. That's the valence band and also the conduction band. Um, that's the experimental value for the interface. That's the experimental value for the clean surface without water in vacuum, okay? So you already see there's a difference, although um, people don't really put them in the same scale to compare. And that's our calculation. We can calculate the, um, because the, those states are all very de delocalized, the adiabatic level and vertical level are really the same, uh, are, are, are really like uh, the same place. So that's our calculation um, using GGA functional, um, just to point out that the conduction band more or less at the same place as the experiment, but also again, the valence band lies too high. Uh, that's, uh, the, um, um, that's a 1.2 EV too high. That's account for the uh, most or almost all of the un error in the, uh, in the band gap, right? Um, and the same for the uh, vacuum. Okay, the conduction band more or less is the same place, but the valence band also too high. I just want to point out that that really there's a big difference between the band alignment with and without water. That's a, a huge difference. And interestingly, if we already have one more of water absorbed on the surface, it will basically uh, uh, account for all, almost the whole interface. Okay, so that's really uh, the thing. The water chemical option can shift in the band alignment by a larger amount um, on TiO2, um, almost one e uh, over one EV. Just um, recently, we look at a lot of uh, metal uh, interface. That's really the same situation. We found uh, water chemical option can shifting the interface potential due to the uh, electronic re uh, redistrib redistribution. When water comes over on the surface, that's a chemical bond, right? That will uh, induce a electronic redistribution that causes a large dot dipole on the order for, for strongly uh, uh, active metal like platinum that can shift the 
uh, interface um, um, interface potential by over one EV. That's really the same uh, on on TiO two. Okay. Um, now I uh, making progress. We have now the band alignment for the valence band, conduction band of TiO two, and and also the water in separate. We also have the levels uh, in the in the uh, in the solution. Okay, and of course at the same time we can also calculate the levels in the uh, in the in the bulk and the service. Uh, just to point out to align just uh, levels, we really need to have a consistent uh, uh, potential reference, which in this case is a standard hatching level. And another thing I want to point out, because uh, the density functional is almost error free for the PKAs, that's basically for a proton insertion process. Um, then uh, we, we are rather confident that this uh, computational standard hatching level is also uh, error, uh, density functional error free. So that, uh, uh, that's uh, also save a uh, lot of problem when we compare to experiment. Um, okay, I guess um, that's all the uh, first break. I probably take up too much time. Uh, I guess if we have questions, we can already uh, discuss it in here. Thank you. So just a reminder that this is the first part and there will be a second part and then the second Q&A at the end. So feel free to ask questions. Um, I think you, you can do it now directly. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe uh, I, can, I, I, can, I can start maybe just to initiate that. Um, yeah. I think maybe, well, I'll start from the, from the end of your presentation. So you said that uh, water, when you include the water, you have a significant shift in, in the energy, in the positions of energies uh, for the band. So would you say that whenever people calculate, um, um, whenever they, they try to predict electrocatalysis and oxides, yeah. and they don't include any liquid, they just do a direct absorption, so they calculate the absorption energies, um, that this is not quite relevant for electrocatalysis? Or would you say that there is actually a just a systematic shift that you can sort of incorporate if you just calculate once. So it's 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 like a systematic shift that you can you can still compare the um, the calculated energies um, in vacuum without being um, um, without fearing sort of without being concerned about the electrolyte absence. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good question. That, so um, I, that's actually an um, for electrocatalysis or for the electrocatalysis, whether on metal and uh, on oxide, when people do the calculation, they really uh, very often the electrochemical environment is not taken into account. Mm -hmm. um, later on, people, of course, will try to put also uh, in, in, in place solvation model, also put the counter charge, whether it's classical or more explicit ions on. Um, to take into account the, uh, the environment effect on, on the reactions uh, for lots of chemical reactions. But still, um, the electrochemical potential uh, very often is not well defined on those systems. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's also, uh, of course, um, in the field, the people do this surface uh, phase diagram try to get the, uh, using the ab initial, for example, some of the dynamics. The, the uh, Corbett diagram, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, uh, the environment very often is not taken into account. People work out the surface diagram or the pooper diagram based on some of the dynamics. And the environment is not explicitly taken into account in the model, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, these days people know that uh, the so-called pH effect or cation effect on catalysis, certainly those explicit environment will be very important for electrocatalysis. But on the other hand, uh, I would say electrocatalysis has a large, um, um, very much uh, relate to the chemist option. Although simplified, those model still take into account the chemist option. Um, 
if you are not explicitly worried about the electron transfer across the interface, um, as I will also explain slightly later, uh, people do, for example, proton hydrogen insertion mm -hmm. uh, or hydrogen deletion, not really proton and electron in separate, right? Uh, from some of the dynamics point of view, that's saved a lot of problems. Okay, that's a very, uh, 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 say, ingenious device, I would say. Um, although uh, it's not really quite electrochemistry uh, uh, for my taste. Uh, so that's, uh, I, uh, I guess those models are still very useful for understanding electrocatalysis. But uh, I agree with you that that's still, uh, it's, uh, we are not clear yet uh, how the electrochemical environment affecting those reactions. So unfortunately, we can't do that right now. So that's still a lot of problem to be solved. Mm. Um, anyone have has any questions? Okay, can I ask? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, I, I, I have uh, several questions. The first one is why you didn't use uh, in your consideration the overpotential scale because it is very convenient. In this case, you don't need to calculate the reaction-free energy. Sorry, what is the energy? Why you do, uh, don't use the over potential scale, uh, considering uh, your uh, free energy surfaces? This is the question. I think uh, it, would be, it would be more convenient, a more simple way to treat um, uh, your system. Uh, um, okay, I, I'm not quite sure I really get your question. Um, so the over potential scale to do what? Just uh, if uh, you have zero over potential, then the free energy of the initial and, fi and final state uh, are equal. And if you have non-zero potential, uh, then you have some shift. So uh, this means that we can model in this uh, scale uh, the reaction uh, free energy. Uh, yeah, but how that we basically are calculating the redox potential. That's a free energy corresponding to the standard condition. So that's what, what you would do. Uh, as the first place, but um, unless the process is very fast, okay, uh, when you already have can reach thermodynamic equilibrium, of course, uh, you, you, you don't have to explicit calculate those free energy difference. But uh, very often it's not the case for many applications. Um, okay. It, am I answering your question? So, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, uh, okay. And the second question is you considered uh, so far only the uh, reorganization energy. This means that you assumed the linear response theory. But in your reaction, we have basically uh, the bond break as well. And this means that you have to consider also some intramolecular contribution. What do you think about this? And this intramolecular contribution can 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 be uh, in general strongly nonlinear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, uh, in the region of the barrier, and it would be important probably. Sure, sure, sure. No, no, in here, I just to point out that uh, in, uh, so in a making energy to uh, Markov theory, so we can calculate the uh, free energy from the vertical energy. But when all the free energy I present in my talk, actually, I, I using some dynamic integration. In this case, you can see that this free energy, uh, uh, basically, this integration curve is not linear at all. Uh, particularly for proton insertion, it's a very nonlinear process. I agree with you. The solvent response is not linear at all. 
that's the reason we do some of the NAMI migration. So uh, in that sense, it's, it's, it's really rigorous. We don't, we don't. Uh, although we may have statistical error, but uh, yeah, the, 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 the theory is solid. We, we don't use in the linear response theory. Okay, we do explicit some of the NAMI integration. Oh, okay, thank you. And uh, I have also a very small remark. Uh, you told that if, uh, if the reorganization energy for reduction is equal to reorganization energy of oxidation, this means, uh, yes, yes, just this one, yeah. a linear response yeah. approximation. I like to believe uh, it's not quite correct because even if you have a strong difference between uh, these two quantities, so lambda r and lambda o, we can uh, we can use the linear approximation uh, because it is a question of uh, whether you can approximate your um, free energy surfaces by parabolas or not. But uh, you, 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 you can uh, also have a strong non-equality between lambda r and lambda o. And mm. in this case, you, you are still, uh, you can use the linear approximation, okay? Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, studio Markov theory is widely used in the field. Now, uh, um, uh, particularly you, when you want to calculate the uh, electron transfer kinetics, right? Uh, people still use the Markov uh, formula. But um, okay, I, I don't get me wrong. When we calculate the free energy, we don't want to rely on model. Okay, we using uh, some NAMI integration is a really a rigorous uh, theory. There's a theory to to really uh, uh, connecting the free energy by uh, the free energy change by this integral here. So I, I just want to point out we don't make make approximation in this sense. Of course, linear response theory. It's fine, particularly uh, when we want to understand things. That's a uh, that's a very good one, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jun, maybe I can ask last more question and before you proceed. So, sure. um, when you go to, um, I think to the slide when you discuss titanium oxide. It's um, probably one, if you move back one more slide. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you discussed, so you, you, um, you had a discussion about two different types of sites, right? One is apical, one yeah. is um, the, um, uh, the breach site. Yeah. So obviously you have different chemistries there. Yeah. And so yeah. the question that I have is um, when you, you will be discussing it further too, um, the band alignment, the bands are defined um, without the localities in some way, at least in the way that people um, draw them. But I would say that if, if I look at this, um, then the, the double layer structure will be different, probably somewhat different from one side to another. So if you have this type of systems where you, for example, you have ligands and you have metals, like this is um, titanium oxide is a metal ligand, system, it's not pure yeah. metal. So there are, there is a heterogeneity in sites on the surface. Yeah. So then the band, the band, um, sort of the band alignment, will it be different for, for the electrolyte site for different local um, parts of, of, of the, um, of the crystal, uh, of the two dimensional crystal lattice? Yeah. Uh, um, but you, you just have to integrate the, it and, and whatever, take an average. Uh, yeah, when you take an average, is it really correct way or do you have to? Yeah. yeah. Um, in our case, we, we, we really average it over. Okay. So you talk about more of a like heterogeneity at the atomic or molecular scale. Exactly. Um, of course, that's there. I, I, I totally agree with you, particularly if you have other absorbate on the surface, it will certainly change the local, uh, for example, potential distribution or even the field, local field. Uh, but anyway, but the band alignment, when we talk about is more of a microscopic uh, 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 quantity. So we have yeah. to average over the whole, uh, across our whole interface, right? Yeah, so the reason why I'm asking is because obviously the molecular transformations, if you look at, say, electrocatalysis on these materials, yeah. then they are about the molecules. The molecules about the size of those sites, basically. Yeah. So yeah. does it mean that you have to take into account this heterogeneity at the atomic scale um, when you really look at 
how the molecules uh, react with the surface. Yeah, you, in principle, yes. But of course, when we do the, if we want, really want to do this calculation, we have to aver, average over a very long time, right? Mm -hmm. um, then the, for example, the IM position may also change. We will need to average all, uh, 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 basically along the surface. So the, uh, um, in principle, yes, that has to do with the local structure. Okay, but I just want to mention that also to point out that we need to average all the possible configurations. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Is it still possible to ask a question? Um, yeah, I guess so. Okay. I Maybe just asked it's a short one. Yeah, very short one. I, I asked some details about thermodynamic inte integration. I just, uh, I, I think I understand the point that uh, you use this method to calculate the free energy difference, but uh, uh, use this method is that usually the two given state, you, you should know the, the, the two states before you use th this method. But for this electrochemical reactions, there's, I mean, it's complex and uh, what yeah. kind of initial and yeah. final uh, yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah, in calculating free energy, you need to be able to define your initial state and final state. And also, you, you very often, you have to define also your reaction coordinate. Okay, uh, that, that, that's true. Uh, in our case, in this case, uh, um, depending on what kind of reaction you are looking at, you may have different ways of defining your uh, initial and uh, final state, and also the reaction coordinates, also a matter of choice very often. Um, in, uh, in our case, we basically calculate redox potential that then the two states corresponding to the oxidized and the reduced state. That's the system with one electron, uh, 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 with, for example, an electron and uh, uh, the system with one electron more or less, right? So that's, that's really uh, well defined for us. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess uh, I need to yes. proceed now. We can, we can I, continue. Yeah, I guess uh, I need to speed up a bit because <laughs> uh, I probably uh, uh, the first half a bit too slow. But anyway, I will try to catch up in the second half. Um, okay, um, let me go this bit. All right. Um, Okay, I will um, now carry on. Uh, the first thing I want to also do the uh, level alignment on the surface. Okay, uh, that's um, then I will move a bit quick to also uh, what we talk about the catalysis, the proton couple, the electron transfer, and also the charge, the uh, electrophile interface in the end, uh, rather briefly. Um, so in the photocatalysis, so the uh, upon photo excitation, we know the electron and the hole eventually goes to the surface and trap there, and we know the tra hole trapping on the surface uh, can lead to uh, lots of applications, the photo degradation of uh, pollutants and so on. Those are the many reactions driven by the the uh, trapped holes. But the identity of surface trapped holes, uh, uh, there are lots of proposals, right? That are surface also have um, uh, on the surface or subsurface. There's also even uh, free holes. Um, so deluxe holes no localized on one or two particular sites. Um, there's lots of proposal, but just um, in in um, just one second. In literature, um, um, just lots of experimental technique have have been developed or applied to study those those holes to uh, identify the energetics the energy levels and the identity of those holes um, for in, for instance in this in this uh, in this work uh, professor Salvador already uh, put a lot of uh, survey of the uh, photo emission spectroscopy result and um, okay just quickly put to get to the conclusion is they found all the surface water on TiO2, of course, or also OH minus, the, the, the signal very often is below the valence band. Okay. And in, in, 
in in that case, they 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 really think this level is less too low. Then the hole cannot be trapped on this species. Okay, uh, for uh, then the, the, for that reason, for example, uh, they will not form an OH radical because the OH minus level lies too low. The hole will rather stay, for example, in the valence band edge. Um, so that's the uh, in, um, interpretation of the photo emission spectroscopy. Um, and there's another uh, measurement uh, called transient absorption spectroscopy. So that's basically a um, uh, upon the photo excitation, you will generate lots of electron and holes in the system. Then you shine another light to probe those uh, stabilized, sort of stabilized whole electron. And the, then the signal the, um, is, or this, those, those, those peaks are really um, interpreted as the photo excitation uh, of a valence band, um, uh, electron excited from valence band to this whole state. Okay, and uh, you can already see here that's a, uh, at a very uh, a short wavelength that's on the order of two or three uh, to around two and a half EV. So we know for TiO2, the band gap around three EV that puts this level just below the conduction band. Okay, uh, roughly a half EV gap. And in this case, so people think this hole, uh, it lies to that high, that's basically saying this hole have a very, have very little uh, oxidizing power, right? That's basically the potential at a very negative, almost to zero volt with respect to standard hydrogen electrode, then you cannot oxidize anything, uh, anything uh, uh, important uh, using this hole, right? Because um, it, it's just not oxidizing enough. So that's a really, um, and uh, the experiment of uh, two different experiments seems give a, 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 a um, contradictory uh, result. On the one hand, the hole cannot be uh, trapped, okay, at all. On the other hand, the trapped hole cannot really oxidizing, uh, don't have enough power to oxidizing, uh, for instance, uh, pollutant. Um, um, uh, we what do we do? We we calculate the uh, the whole trapping at the TiO2 water interface. That's um, that's a, a technical issue. As I mentioned, that to ca calculate correct, put the this whole level correctly, we have to using high level uh, functional this screen hybrid functional HSE because GGA will not localize the whole at all. But just to point out that we, we run a trajectory of this TIOT water interface using hybrid functional. We do see the whole, this green bubble you see here is basically the spin density of this uh, um, initially OH radical. I just want to show it again. So you can see this spin oscillating between this OH group and a, a three coordinate oxygen on surface. Okay, at some point you can even see the the protonation of this OH radical to form a OH minus uh, oxygen minus on the surface, and the proton goes to the bridge oxygen. Okay, clearly we can see uh, the hole can be localized on the surface, and we can also see the hole localized on the subsurface and even the bulk oxygen. Um, okay, based on the trajectory, we can analyze the structure, how the spin density. Uh, uh, evolve um, uh, with the, uh, the, the local structure. Uh, we can see, as I just pointed out, that the OH group, you can have like a sharing spin density between the OH radical and the uh, surface oxygen. And the, when it's set, the distance between these two oxygen gets too long, you can see the proton, the, the spin can really, this unpaired electron can really localize on the surface oxygen. And at some point, when the OH goes a bit too high, sort of is not really dissolv dissolving from the surface, but the distance between the OH and titanium gets a bit longer, you can see the full spin localized on the OH, so almost like OH radical. And in the end, we can see the deprotonation of this OH radical. Then we have the oxygen um, uh, radical anion absorbed on the surface. Um, 
anyway, that's so all we, uh, from our MD trajectory, we can see lots of different states. We also reproduce those state by using a simplified one model layer uh, 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 water model so that we can calculate those energy levels, okay, by, for example, look at the project density state. And we also calculate the energy difference to work out the, uh, the uh, redox level, let's say, the adiabatic level associating with these uh, different whole states. Um, eventually, we actually have, uh, we, we found four uh, trap holes. Uh, the first one, as I mentioned, is terminal OH, okay? And also the uh, deeper than the state of the terminal OH. And the hole can also localize on the bridge as well, bridge oxygen. And uh, there's a sort of a physics of the OH uh, uh, that show you a bit detached from the surface. Okay, we can reproduce those whole states. Um, that's how we plot these levels. So um, again, I, I, I show this level triples. We have, um, as I mentioned, we have this vertical level, vertical analyzation potential for the reduced state that will be the OH minus in this case, indeed buried well below the valence band. And we also have the vertical electron affinity of the oxidized state. So that's a, uh, for the OH radical. And this uh, red line is the redox level, okay? That's uh, the same plot I showed you early on but just uh, uh, putting the different contexts. Um, now I, I want to explain the, uh, the, uh, what the spectroscopy measurement, uh, to what those levels corresponding to. From the photo emission spectroscopy, people measure the, the, um, um, the level associated with the OH minus or the water, the P orbital, right? But those levels indeed, that's associated with the vertical ionization potential of this OH minus, so that it's well below the valence band, okay? And, the, and this vertical electron affinity, that's associating with the transient absorption spectroscopy, that's basically an electron vertically excited from the valence band edge to this whole state, okay? Without relaxing the lattice, right? After, re Reorgan so that's basically uh, the photo, uh, that's the transient absorption spectroscopy signal. So that's what corresponding to this horse I showed, uh, this uh, signals I showed you earlier on. But after reorganization, okay, that will give you the reorganized hole. So that's, uh, so this difference between the adiabatic level and the vertical level, this reorganization energy on surface holes on the order of two EV, okay? In that case, that puts this level uh, around uh, two volt with respect to standard hydrogen electrode, okay? So that's the adiabatic level determining the stability of the surface hole and also determining the oxidizing power of the OH radical. So um, um, that's basically to say, although the vertical ionization potential is well below the valence band, uh, band edge, but it's really this uh, re adiabatic level we should compare. That's basically a free hole can localize on this OH radical because that's the uh, you, you, uh, adiabatic level we should uh, compare with, okay? And the, um, uh, for this ele vertical electron affinity for the oxide state, so this level, although it's a bit too high, so, but still is this level determining the oxidizing ability of OH radical? Okay, that's two volt as I mentioned. So that's uh, uh, sufficient to oxidizing, uh, to oxidize many, many things. Okay, uh, that's basically, I guess, it's just the uh, different levels we should uh, compare uh, to use when we consider the uh, uh, spectroscopy, we consider we should consider the vertical level. But if we want to look at the stability or the thermodynamics or redox, redox potential, we have to look, really look at the adiabatic level. Uh, it's really this uh, huge reorganization energy uh, make a very uh, make a, um, uh, uh, the difference. 
similarly, we can also do uh, excess electrons. Uh, the electron can travel also on the surface. Um, um, we, we do the same level alignment just to point out the, the electron can lo localize on the surface titanium, this bridge side, and also can localize on the uh, terminal. So that's a terminal titanium side. So that's a give you titanium three plus can the electron can also localize in the bulk titanium. So those are all give you different, uh, slightly different levels. Again, you have the vertical ionization potential uh, for, the, for, the, for the excess electron uh, for the reduced state. And the, this green, uh, this red lines associated with the adiabatic level. So that's where you basically determine whether the electron can be localized on the titanium side. In this case, of course, you can because it lies below the conduction band edge, right? And it can also reduce things because uh, it's, 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 uh, the, this level lies uh, around the zero volt with respect to standard hydrogen network. Okay, so um, that's how we align the uh, electron, uh, the levels associated with the electron. Now I, I, I show you uh, this picture in here um, by putting all these levels on the same potential scale of uh, standard hydrogen electrode reference, uh, we can do alignment of the TiO2, uh, the band alignment of TiO2 and the bulk water and the levels inside the bulk semiconductor and the levels inside the solution. And the most importantly, so also the levels on the surface. Of course, that uh, will have, uh, have be very important for, for, for catalysis. So that's what I'm going to uh, talk about next. But to, to point out right now, uh, we don't have, we haven't electrified the interface. So all those calculations are done at the flat band potential and the point of zero charge condition. Okay. So um, now we move on to the, um, um, the proton coupled electron transfer, as also mentioned that. Um, um, the, the, the valence band hole can oxidize the water. Uh, it has to lie below the valence, the, for example, this oxygen evolution level. But very often, a very large gap is required. That's our over potential in order to drive the reaction, right? So uh, in order to optimize the uh, energy efficiency, we, we need to find a good catalyst uh, having lower over potential. That's the uh, very well-known um, computational hydrogen electrode model developed by Professor Noskov and uh, uh, Ross Meisel. I guess many of you already, that's a very successful uh, model um, already developed in 2004. Uh, just very quickly to, to uh, explain this, um, we call the thermodynamic over potential model. Uh, in, in their model, really, they uh, look at the water oxidation, think of like a four step electron. Um, say, couple the electron proton transfer process. Um, in their model, they look at the, um, uh, in this case, just to show here, a dehydrogenation process from water to OH radical, okay? Then oxygen, OOH, um, dioxygen, and so on. So in each step, the electron and the proton are move, removed at the same time. And they're also using the concept of a standard hydrogen electrode, the dehydrogenation energy can be directly uh, placed in the uh, standard hydrogen electrode scale. Okay, then um, that that potential is also uh, really uh, um, uh, uh, well defined. Can be compared to uh, experiment, but just to point out that by doing this, um, uh, we actually. Um, um, avoiding calculating um, charge of the species, if you look at this uh, from water to H radical, um, we always move one hydrogen. We don't have charge separation. Avoiding calculating species like OH minus. Uh, uh, previously, I mentioned that OH minus is uh, uh, so the, the charge species sometimes sometimes uh, and tricky to to treat. Uh, on the periodic boundary condition. But in this case, we don't have to worry about because we're always dealing with neutral species. 
And then another time, uh, another thing is because they are all neutral, solvation in fact is somewhat uh, insignificant. Particularly, the solvation free energy for those neutral species roughly uh, 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 half EV on that order, or even just around 0.3 for many radicals, 0.3 EV. But when you take the energy difference, those so solvation free energy cancels. However, if you want to treat in a charge species like OH minus, for example, deprotonation step from water to OH minus, uh, initially water is neutral, but OH minus is charged, then the solvation in fact cannot be canceled because uh, the OH minus will involve a huge uh, uh, um, uh, uh, relaxation from the solvent. So that's all I have uh, energy. Uh, uh, that will have a, uh, a uh, energy gain. That's certainly affecting this deprotonation energy, right? Uh, anyway, that's a bit technical bit from computational point of view. But the, the idea of the whole model is we can calculate the, the stability of this species. We can also put the uh, 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 like a staircase energy diagram like here, uh, like um, the full the full electron transfer step, we know the total energy because it's a basically a solution gas uh, uh, species has nothing to do with surface. So it's a full time, the 1.23. So the, the whole energy is 4.92 EV. So that's, it's fixed. Then those species actually are on the surface or absorbed on the surface. Then um, in an ideal uh, situation, okay, those levels we even is spaced. So each of them have 1.23. When we want to oxidize the water, we just apply a potential for say 1.23 volt. That we are basically shifting this energy, right, of the electron. Then that will some they will drive the, the uh, basically lower down this uh, energy levels for the for this intermediate ste uh, step. So apply 1.2 volt, that will basically, you are having uh, uh, like um, battery free, uh, free energy uh, profile. Of course, that's, that's a thermodynamics. dynamics, uh, just to mention that we don't have any uh, kinetic barrier. Okay, it's not the activation energy I mentioned, that's just the, uh, the thermodynamics. Uh, if we have a diagram like here, um, we, for certain step, uh, okay, we still have very small gap, but just to point out, if we have one step, have a too small energy, so smaller than 1.3, because the two end is fixed, that basically means we must have a step, have, have a greater gap than 1.3, okay? In that case, if we're still using this 1.23 uh, volts, uh, uh, thermodynamic driving force, uh, we are not enough to drive this step, right? Because um, uh, the, the gap is too large. We still need to feed, feed in extra uh, uh, potential. So that's our over potential kick in. Uh, in that case, we, we will have all the uh, energy levels goes um, uh, down full, but, but uh, certainly we will have energy waste because we have to supply extra over potential. Okay, so that's how uh, the thermodynamic over potential uh, model works, and it's proved being very successful in the field. And um, as the uh, tech te technical advantage, I just mentioned that the, for those cases, we don't even consider, uh, we don't need to consider charge the species, and uh, lots of calculation can be done in, uh, uh, in a rather uh, simple setup, sometimes even in vacuum. Of course, you can also put sort of infinite solvation model to, to make the study more accurate. But uh, the, the point is really, uh, uh, is the thermodynamic behind this, this model uh, make this very powerful and avoid uh, lots of uh, technical difficulties. But if, uh, the uh, problem, of course, um, um, in, in, uh, in real um, uh, water oxidation mechanism, Proton and electron are not necessarily uh, concerted. They are not necessarily coupled, right? Uh, and uh, in um, photosystem too, in biology, people know that uh, in this extended cork cycle, 
the proton and electron can really go in a se sequential manner, okay? You can have proton transfer step and electron transfer step. You know, then you will have to dealing with the charge species. So you, uh, using the uh, methodology I just uh, previously mentioned, uh, calculating the pKa, that's basically associating uh, removing one proton or removing one electron. We can calculate in the, uh, basically the deprotonation energy, for example, terminal water to form a terminal OH radical. And then we can also calculate the oxidation potential uh, by basically uh, oxidizing the OH radical, uh, OH minus to OH radical. We can also do uh, other uh, steps as well. So uh, sort of this uh, proton couple electron transfer triangle, um, uh, the thermodynamics. Um, just to put uh, in similar context, okay, how that is related to, to, to this, uh, just to point out that's the diagonal energies, that's basically this energy in this staircase in the uh, uh, Noskov's model. Uh, uh, basically, we, what, what we can do just slightly bit better, we, we, we do the proton and electron transfer in separate step, or we also calculate the, uh, the deprotonation and oxidation energy. Um, in here, uh, I also want to using a level diagram to uh, analyze the catalytic, uh, uh, the catalysis. Um, this is a, I, I using this acidity scale, the so-called protonic energy levels proposed by Professor Joachim Meyer to, to really visualize the uh, thermodynamics of ionic defect in solids as well as in solution, okay? For example, you can have pKa scales for, for example, in solution. Uh, is that the same way of how we look at the electronic energy level? Um, I, I just want to uh, demonstrate that in, in this lab, level diagram here. Um, okay, uh, suppose we have this uh, PCET triangle, we have all these energies. Um, we have the potential scale, the electronic potential scale. Uh, we put all these oxidation potential, okay, in this level diagram, that's in the water, it's not on the TiO2 surface yet, okay, and then um, that's our 1.23. Uh, I, I also draw a pKa scale associated with the protonic level, so we align the zero, the reference of these two scale, but we want, we put the pKa scale they, 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 they point up, so they are opposite to the uh, electronic scale. Um, what do we do? We now put the deprotonation energy in this pKa scale, uh, uh, just like this. As you already can see that that's the energy cost from zero, look at the red scale, that's the energy cost uh, you take to oxidize the OH minus, that's the energy from here to here in this scale is the energy you take to deprotonate the water, okay? Then this gap, okay, this difference between these two levels, that's basically corresponding to the dehydrogenation uh, energy. That's also the, the level, uh, um, that's what uh, 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 Professor Noskov and Ross Meisel use in the, uh, in the computational hydrogen lateral model, right? Um, okay, in their model, they think that all the staircase have to uh, really the same. Uh, that's basically saying that all this gap have to say it's the same. But in, um, when we separate the transfer of the electron and the proton, then we actually have two sets of levels. So it's the electro potential drives the electron transfer. That's basically says all the red levels, that's the electronic level should be aligned in order to minimize the thermodynamic over potential. And the, this blue lines that the associated with the PK, that the deprotonation level should be aligned because that transfer is driven by pH, is driven by the electrochemical potential of the proton. Uh, in the electrolyte solution, right? So in order to also minimize the over potential, we have to align both the pKa levels and the electronic levels. Uh, one, uh, that the requirement is slightly stricter than, the, than just 
than just uh, uh, having the same dehydrogenation energy, basically at by high, the same gap. We also need to have the same levels uh, for 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 both both uh, both sets, right? Now we look at uh, move to the uh, uh, what do we calculate for TiO2, um, the water oxidation step on surface. Um, just at the levels we have uh, the uh, the energies we have we put in the diagram that's uh, associated with the oxidation uh, energy uh, on TiO2 surface, and then we also put the pKa levels in here. Um, we we can clearly see compared to those level in aqueous solution. Uh, the first thing we notice right now the pKa is more or less aligned the pKa levels. Okay, but not quite the oxidation level. And another thing is really the uh, look at the um, this big gap. So that's uh, uh, the first step is a, say potential limiting step because uh, in TR in water this gap is two point seven volt. It's really huge. Uh, on the surface, th the first step now is reduce the energy is reduced to two volt. Okay, it's uh, reduced by quite a lot, it's still not enough, right? Because uh, the optimal one is 1.23. Uh, we now have to vote, but it's still a significant uh, achievement. But the point is, if we look at the difference of the electronic levels, the difference is actually not big, it's relatively small. However, look at the pKa levels. The water on the, uh, on the surface becomes much more acidic than the water in solution, okay? Then the surface water can be much easier, uh, can be deprotonate, get it deprotonated much easier, okay? Uh, that's what makes uh, the, uh, the water oxidation, say, uh, uh, easier, particularly for the first coupled electron and proton transfer step. So it's really the TiO2 is a ionic solid. We can polarize the water and when water absorbed on the titanium side, the, the water become uh, uh, very acidic. PKA is around seven, seven P, uh, around seven compared to 15 in water. So that's a, a huge uh, reduce. So that's this step. Just to point out that that's really another way of uh, vi uh, visualizing uh, by using this level diagram um, uh, um, in comparison to this uh, staircase uh, energy profile used by uh, by the some by the computational hydrogen electrode model. Okay, um, uh, fine. Um, all those previous calculations are still done on neutral interface. Okay, uh, we are not there, there yet to explicitly take into account the uh, electrophile the interface at the uh, the um, the, um, uh, uh, the 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 proton electron transfer reactions uh, on, on if, for example in the double layer but uh, the when we treat the electric double layer we want to first look at the how the dielectric response uh, of the interface water and also the ion structure sort of the first step to understand the double layer uh, but the of course as, as i mentioned that on a semiconductor water interface we actually have also space charge layer in this uh, semiconductor is is huge right depends on the doping level and the potential you apply um it's it's difficult explicitly to treat that at the um, a first principle calculation um but for the electric double layer on oxide water interface at the electrolyte side as i mentioned that it's very it's de uh, determined by the proton charge on the surface where which we actually can simulate um in this case, uh, for example, at the high pH, at the very alkaline conditions, the surface, for example, the terminal water can get deprotonated. Then you will have OH minus, they were attracting the counter ions. The ions, for example, the, the sodium cation, they can ha could have different solvation structure, a sort of outer sphere complex. You have a, a fully solvated structure. Uh, a certain case, you the the cation may get partially dissolved, directly coordinate with the surface OH group, sort of forming the inner sphere complex. And uh, at the acidic condition, a low pH, 
the bridge or oxygen can get protonated. So you have a positive charge, then they will attract in the anion. Okay, in this case, uh, the fluor fluoride. Uh, you can also have an outer sphere complex with a fully solvation, full solvation shell and also uh, inner sphere complex by partially dissolving the uh, anion. Um, okay, uh, using our AIMD, uh, ab initial molecular dynamics, we could simulate the compact double layer, sort of the home host, uh, uh, the uh, double layer. So uh, ne uh, for the moment, uh, neglecting all the diffuse layer um, effect. But just to point out, uh, in any electrochemistry application, we tend to have very high concentration uh, anyway. So the diffuse double layer very often is suppressed. So all the uh, chemistry will really happen as a compact double layer. Um, as I mentioned, that the surface group have different uh, pKa's, right? Uh, also, the point of zero proton charge is a measure of the average acidity of the oxide surface. Uh, for TiO2, we have two sites. I mentioned we have a terminal water. Uh, then you will have a, that's a conjugated acid, that terminal water. They can get deprotonated to form an OH minus. So that's a, a, uh, uh, for the terminal site. And there's another type of site, that's a bridge site, the oxygen can get a protonate. So you form a bridge OH in, uh, in, in some sense, you can call it the OH plus, bridge OH plus. Um, so that's a, another a conjugate base and acid. So they, you basically have two pairs of uh, 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 acidic sites, right? Um, we could calculate the pKa's of those two sites and the point of zero proton charge is really just the average of two pKa's of this size. It turns out uh, from our calculation, the PG point of, point of zero charge around four or five uh, pK units. That's basically uh, what um, also experimentally measured. Um, so that's the PGC for TiO2. So seem, seem, seem not bad, the calculation. But of course, deviating from when the pH deviating from the point of zero charge, you will, we will start to have to charge up the surface, uh, then the double layer will form, right? And uh, in our, um, when we simulate the double layer, uh, we basically inserting different number of protons on the surface, and then we put the counter ions. Uh, that's basically uh, uh, to balance the charge, the surface proton charge. So overall, the interface is neutral. Um, um, and we are also in our periodic boundary condition, we actually have two symmetric interface, okay? Uh, that's a way form our double layer. Uh, we, we can measure the electrical potential. We can calculate the electrical potential difference uh, uh, at a different surface charge density. Uh, then, um, okay, that we, we, we can compare, uh, calculate the capacitance, okay? Uh, we, we simulate two type of, uh, in, uh, uh, counter charge, as I mentioned, the outer sphere complex and the inner sphere complex. In our short uh, MD trajectory, we don't see, uh, um, say, uh, um, inter uh, conversion between these two complex. So that's may remain rather stable in our tens of picosecond uh, MD trajectory. So, so that we can separate these two type of complex and their capacitance. Uh, I, 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 based, uh, I will uh, skip the structure just to, uh, to, to show you the charging curve we calculate. We basically can, uh, we control the surface charge density by adding a certain number of proton uh, or removing certain number of proton on the surface so that we can charge the surface. And then we calculating the electrical potential. So then that, that will give us the, the, this charging curve. The slope will directly give us the compa capacitance of the double sort of the dielectric response of the surface of the interface of water. Uh, um, so for different complexes, outer or inner sphere complex, we can see different, uh, say slightly different capacitances. We, um, it's more or less understandable because the inner sphere complex will get the cation, the ions get the surface closer, right? Then the separation, uh, you think of the double layer as a capacitor, then the separation of the two plates is small, then you, you will have a higher uh, 
comparisons, more or less you expect. Uh, but you can still see it's not entirely entirely linear, slightly curved. So the so the dielectric constant is not uh, or the comparison is really not a uh, constant. Um, I will give you an extreme case just to show um, the dielectric response is really not linear. And then the uh, comparison, the differential comparison uh, uh, can, 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 can really vary with this uh, surface charge density of the potential. So this example is from a recent calculation on uh, tin oxide uh, 110. Uh, tin oxide is very different from um, the, 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 is there also a rutile root, structure very similar to rutile TiO2. Uh, it's quite different in the sense that um, on, T, on TiO2, a very small fraction of water dissociate on, on the surface. Okay, uh, you don't see much. But on tin oxide, roughly uh, at the point of zero charge, half of water dissociate on the surface. Okay. So then you have a mixture of, uh, for example, for the terminal water and the terminal OH minus. For the bridge side, you have a mixture of bridge oxygen and a bridge OH plus. So uh, at the point of zero charge. When we charge up the surface, uh, we can really see the water. Um, uh, this alpha is really, we, that's a measure uh, of water dissociation. Um, uh, at the point of zero charge, half around 0.6 water dissociate. So that's the uh, uh, is a dissociation fraction. When we change the surface charge density, basically different uh, pH condition, or then you have a different uh, uh, double layer uh, potential, right? Uh, the water dissociation fraction really varies, change. Uh, you could already uh, imagine when water uh, um, be, before and after dissociation, um, that will have a different, say, sort of dipole. If you have a, for instance, a, a fully a full water and a dissociated water, then you will have a different dipole. That will have an extra dielectric response to to the uh, to, to 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 the field uh, in the double layer, right? Because uh, uh, normally, um, dielectric response of water comes from the orientational uh, 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 response, basically uh, applying a field of water, just turning around, uh, changing the dipole or aligning the dipole to the field. But at the interface, the water dissociation um, can actually have an extra response to the, uh, to the, to the, to the electric field then uh, we actually can obtain this shape, a bell shape, this come uh, shape, uh, dialect, uh, differential compactance with a uh, uh, quite large maximum around over 150, around 150 near the po point of zero charge condition sort of gets smaller uh, when the uh, surface have a uh, much uh, greater charge. So that, that uh, clearly you can see there's a symmetric uh, uh, um, dielectric uh, differential capacitance on TiO2. So that's a really, it's just the specific absorption of the uh, uh, configuration of the water at the point of zero charge cause this uh, symmetric dielectric uh, double layers. Okay. Um, I guess um, that's basically just the double layer uh, the electric double layer, but um, at the electrolyte solution. Um, and if we think of the uh, interaction between the space charge layer and the electric double layer, purely electrostatic, then we can think of just say two capacitor in series. So it's sort of model to, 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 uh, to take into account the, the um, let's say the, the, uh, the charging, effect of the uh, uh, semiconductor water interface. But uh, in the end, I just want you quickly to point out that the, uh, the proton and the electron or the electronic states, electron excess electron or whole states are not, not only electrostatic. Just to show you uh, on the left, um, clearly 
clearly we can see that if we have a terminal water, uh, the water can get depurinated from an OH minus, but at the same side, if the at the very positive potential, it can be oxidized or oxidized by a, by a hole, a hole from the bulk to form a terminal OH radical. Okay, in this case, the proton and the holes coupled strongly chemically at this surface side, at this uh, surface um, OH group. So that's, that's not purely electrostatic. Um, just also to point out for the excess electron, electron localized on the titanium side. So uh, normally we have titanium three plus, but the proton is actually absorbed on the, on the oxygen, right? Then the electron and the proton really goes to different sides, uh, which is different um, from this case I just show you, where electron, uh, where the proton and the holes really coupled at the same oxygen group side. So that will have a um, uh, extra um, um, consequence of the of the uh, uh, of the. Um, uh, electrified um, interface. So the coupling between the proton and the holes. Um, so I, I basically, so that's, uh, um, we, we develop a numerical model uh, to take into account, but uh, I don't really have time to explain the detail, but it's just, we use a numerical modeling of the uh, electrified interface. We apply, uh, basically it's based on continuum model. Uh, we apply the proton, equation, drift diffusion equation, and continuity equation of those char uh, electron holes in semiconductor and also uh, uh, ions in solution. But uh, on the surface, we explicitly take into account the proton and electron transfer, this whole localization I showed you in the last slide, uh, and consider that a Langmuir absorption isosome, okay? And we we couple basically this Langmuir absorption of proton and holes on the surface together with this Poisson uh, equation and the drift diffusion equation and so on, uh, so that we can model how the charge um, uh, distribute across the interface and also the potential uh, distribute across the interface so that we can look at the um, pH and the potential effect uh, for the interface potential distribution. Uh, just very quickly show you this profile. We can calculate different pH because different pH will lead to different protonation state on the surface. And we also change different potential. That will also change how many holes can be localized, can be trapped on the surface. And these holes and the proton can couple through this terminal OH radical, okay? Uh, by uh, biochemical reactions, not just electrostatically. So um, anyway, that's taking into account that we can calculate this type of potential distribution. Um, so that's our uh, Helmholtz layer. That's of course, that's our space charge layer, um, which of course much, uh, have a much uh, greater uh, uh, distance uh, thickness. Uh, just this, uh, this result I, I would like to show you. Um, this type of Puber diagram um, in aqueous solution, if we look, that's basically give you this straight line, right? That's in the homogeneous solution. However, on the surface, then the surface will have OH radical, OH minus and uh, water for the terminal OH, uh, for the terminal water, right? Uh, the terminal site on, on the surface. This surface Puber diagram, we are deviating clearly from what we would expect from the homogeneous solution. And uh, the, the area for the OH minus is uh, shrinking a bit. Uh, that we are also similar, uh, that's somewhat to do with the Nernstein relation. Um, uh, when we shift in the uh, potential, uh, shift in the pH, how the potential response. Uh, anyway, I will only focus on the left. The reason for 
uh, uh, for shrinking, we can see this, this line uh, shift to, for example, more alkaline condition, and also the potential goes a bit lower. Uh, the reason is really when in the alkaline condition, when we form an OH minus, we will charge the interface. Once we charge the interface, we will start to build up the double layer. Uh, from both the space charge layer and also the electric double layer and the electrolyte solution. That will cause, that will have an extra energy cost, okay, to, uh, to charge, up, charge up just, just, just double layer. Then they will have a uh, some dynamic consequence in the surface bubble diagram. You will make uh, the OH minus get slightly more difficult to form because you you have extra energy to to charge to charge up the power. and that also call, uh, cause the uh, deviation from the Stenstein relation at the alpha condition because when in this case alpha equal to zero at the acidic condition and that is uh, Stenstein relation uh, very often we use but at the alkaline condition alpha can go even to one. Yeah, that's basically say the uh, potential is very insensitive to the pH. Um, that's of course because in alkaline condition we only we form OH radical, right? We goes along uh, sorry OH minus, so we we uh, oxidize to directly OH radical. Um, um, just no proton transfer involved. Um, anyway, just to quickly show how uh, we take into account the electrophile the interface by using this numerical uh, modeling. Unfortunately, uh, that's really uh, go beyond what we can do right now using a first principle calculation, simply because this, uh, the system uh, and the size, the time scale, we need to equilibrate those processes way, uh, way, way too long for, for, for our initial calculation. So I guess uh, I, I, I need to end here. I probably already uh, speak too much, but just very quickly about the, uh, uh, just to summarize uh, what uh, I've been talking about. Um, we, we, we basically have this uh, initial molecular dynamic method uh, combined with some other dynamic integration for calculating the redox potential and the PKAs. That's basically the free energy of transferring one electron and one proton in separate, okay? And we using this computational standard hydrogen electron that allows us to align the electronic energy levels at the same potential scale so that we can compare the, the levels across the interface um, in a consistent manner. And also for the proton coupled electron transfer on the surface, uh, we need to separate, uh, uh, consider the electron and the proton transfer in separate. Uh, we using this uh, electronic and the protonic level diagram to help us to, to, uh, to analyze this so-called thermodynamic overpotential model, really in the same spirit of uh, uh, Professor Noskov's model. Um, and uh, when, of course, lots of those, uh, the previous calculation and the consideration are all done at a neutral interface, but the electrified interface is difficult. Uh, right now, at our initial level, we probably can calculate the uh, the, the interface due to the proton charge, that's basically the electric double layer in the electrolyte solution, but the space charge layer uh, uh, is hard to take into account at the initial level, but you might be able to, uh, to investigate the effect by using sort of empirical model based on uh, continuum uh, uh, or those, those, those continuum model using a numerical modeling. Uh, but just to point out that the electron and the proton really um, um, can change the, uh, the charge distribution of the interface and also the potential distribution, which is driven by the electrochemical potential electron and the proton. Okay, that's basically determined by the electro potential and the pH. Um, so uh, we, we, we also need to be careful about the uh, the Nernstein relation very often we apply. That really depends on what condition we are looking at. Uh, sometimes there are uh, Nernstein uh, 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 limit, but 
and in other cases they actually are not. So um, okay, uh, the um, some acknowledgement of course the group uh, that's very important, very enjoyable to uh, working with them and also many collaborators uh, al um, uh, along the year um, and also the fundings. Finally, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, John. It was an excellent, uh, very long talk. Thank you. So um, we're open to questions. If anyone in the audience has any, please go ahead. And I think since it's, it's so, um, we might... oh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I, I have a small question. Um, does uh, the proton transfer uh, in your system uh, proceed as a classical movement or with some quantum effects, for example, with some tunneling from one vibrational energy level to another one? What do you think about this? The proton transfer, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, you, 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 you didn't model it, but what do you think about this? Um, it's a, uh, uh, oh, let's say uh, there are many proton coupled electron transfer has a uh, significant uh, kinetic isotopic effect. That's already a sign that the quantum nuclear effect or uh, quantum tunnel effect is important, right? Um, um, but uh, if you look at the, um, I would say the, that will have more effect to the uh, kinetics than thermodynamics. Right now, uh, we mainly consider the thermodynamics, I would say, for example, the PKA, I wouldn't expect the PKA have a very significant uh, effect due to the quant uh, uh, from the quantum nuclear effect. But the, for the kinetics, that I, I think that's uh, in the other field, particularly in uh, uh, homogeneous system or biological system, the proton transfer, the kinetics has not uh, 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 has a, a significant effect by the um, um, by the uh, quantum tunneling effect. Yeah, we we also start to look at the uh, proton coupled electron transfer kinetics on surface. Yeah, they they, they will could be important. There, yes. And uh, that is the other effect, right? If you think of kinetics, uh, then the, um, we are not necessarily in the adiabatic, uh, non adiabatic region, right? There's a lot of, uh, um, um, sorry, uh, we're not in the adiabatic region. Uh, many cases, we are actually in a non adiabatic region. Then you actually also need to worry about. Uh, many things are associated with the electron transfer as well, right? Okay, thank you. And another question is probably, I'm sorry, probably I simply missed it, uh, this value, but uh, could you repeat probably, what is uh, the activation energy of the rate controlling step in your system? Uh, according, to, according to your, yeah. your estimations. Uh, if you think of uh, oh, you, you the, was the most important, the, uh, yeah, we, we haven't considered in all through, through all my talk. Uh, yeah, we ha I haven't mentioned any kinetics, so we we haven't looked at the uh, um, the kinetic or activation barrier yet. Uh, that's also, I would say, the environment will be very important, uh, particularly the double layer effect. The ion effect will, will be very important uh, for, for the kinetics. We, we, we haven't really looked at that. that. That will be something for the future, I guess. <laughs> if, uh, I guess some of the discussion is sort of meant for the, what, what the future direction. That certainly is important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, maybe I can ask one more question and um, if there are no more, then we will wrap it up. So relevant to the, um, um, the level alignment. So when we uh, look at, uh, so we have the electronic level alignment, we have the protonic ones that you showed already with the surface. So if we look at say batteries or in materials that intercalate protons 
or ions such as lithium, sodium, and so on. So you yeah. also, of course, you can you can extend those levels in, so there will be defect levels. So how much of a difference does it make? Like for for um, in in your case, you you have uh, you use the surface adsorption, um, the pKa's for the surface adsorption to align the levels, right? Yeah. Calculate the energies. So, but in in say during intercalation, you also have the same adsorption. Which then proceeds with the intercalation event. Yeah. So, would you say that for these materials that are typically um, capacitors and and batteries, um, these approaches are also quite applicable and quite important? Yeah. No. The, I, I always think there's a strong, um, uh, say, synergy between those those two type of system. Uh, right now, we basically confine our proton on the surface. Right. The proton is not get intercalate or getting inside the semiconductor. But we actually know lots of oxide have the hydrogen impurity, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically say proton can get in. <laughs> but it, of course, to what extent and how that will affect potential. And um, for oxide like manganese oxide, uh, there's many different phases where you have big channels in the oxide. The proton can certainly get in. That's uh, magnesium, is a, is a battery material, right? uh, and all the thin oxides are also uh, 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 pseudo capacitors. Then the proton and the electron can, yeah, get inside the, uh, mm -hmm. the electron materials. Um, that's also like the lithium battery, uh, uh, lithium intercalation, uh, surely. But I guess the, uh, uh, if you think of the uh, thermodynamics, um, I would say that's very similar. But the, um, the, um, when we look at the interface, we, uh, what will I talk about, the proton is confined on the surface. You will have a double layer, okay? That will affect in the p potential distribution and also affecting how you transform those ions. But if the ions, proton or lithium can get inside the electrode, then the electron and the ions will sort of randomly distribute. You don't have a net double layer, okay? You don't have essentially a charge separation in space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, but still uh, for battery, um, when you intercalate lithium, you have this potential plateau corresponding to the lithium intercalation. However, lots of materials also show pseudo capacitance, right? They have this mm -hmm. capacitive behavior. That's basically saying when you in integrate more ions, uh, eventually these ions will see each other just to, uh, or have a electrostatic interaction, uh, make it more like a capacitor, yeah. But many materials are just like in the between. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I think that at this point we can finish and I'm really happy that you stayed with us till so late and it's mm -hmm. really late night on your side now. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, I think we're finishing it today. Thanks. Okay, good. Uh, our Really, thank you, Andrew, and uh, hopefully see you uh, maybe sometime in person. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'll stop sharing. Thank you.